Welcome to Function Analysis. In this video, we're going to talk about finding the rate of change in an interval and between points. So the rate of change of a function can be examined in three different ways. First, we can examine the average rate of change over an interval of the function's domain. Second, we can examine the average rate of change between any two points on the function. And third, we can examine the rate of change at one specific point on the function. Now, to be honest, these first two are essentially the same. Whether you give an interval for your function and you're looking at the rate of change from the beginning of that interval to the end of that interval, that's technically really no different than finding the rate of change between two points. You're just labeling one of them as the beginning point, one of them as the ending point. So let's talk about those first two. It'll be a separate video for the third one. All right, so here is like the official definition of the average rate of change, right? The average rate of change of a function over an interval of the function's domain is the constant rate of change that yields the same change in the output values as the function yielded on that interval of the function's domain. It is the ratio of the change in the output values to the change in input values over that interval. Yeah, kind of ugly, a little bit confusing. Maybe if you read that three times, hard to understand. But let's try to make this as simple as we can. To find the average rate of change of a function over a closed interval, A to B, all you have to do is find the output of A, noted as f of A, plug A in, get the output. Find the output at B, noted as f of B, plug B in, get the output. And then you're going to find the ratio of the difference in the outputs divided by the difference in the inputs. Hey, that sounds like slope from back in, you know, seventh or eighth grade. Well, it's exactly what it is, right? You simply find the slope between the beginning and the end. That's it. How do you find slope? You subtract your outputs on top, subtract your inputs from those outputs, or that produce those outputs, and the denominator. Pretty simple. So let's look at how easy it is to follow this rule to finding the average rate of change over a closed interval. So here is a pretty cool looking purple function. And let's say that we want to find the average rate of change from the beginning to the end. So the function, um, you know, this function is, is given on a closed interval from negative one to four. So we're only looking at this function in that closed interval. There might be more to the function, but we're only looking at this window from negative one to four. So how do we find the average rate of change from negative one to four? So first off, we need to find the outputs. So what is the output for negative one? Well, the beautiful thing about a graph is you could just look. The output for negative one is eight. What is the output for the end of the graph? Four? Well, look at the function, look at the graph. Looks like it's also eight. So to find the average rate of change, we're simply going to subtract our outputs on top. So that's eight minus eight. And we're going to subtract our inputs in the denominator, four minus negative one. So eight minus eight is zero. Four minus negative one actually turns into a positive. So that's going to be a five. But regardless, we get zero. Now that actually makes 100 complete sense because if we draw a line connecting the beginning point to the ending point, the rate of change, the average rate of change from the beginning to the end of this function is exactly that. It's the slope of that line connecting the two points. And the slope of that line pretty clearly is zero. So although in between the function is changing, it's going up, it's coming back down, and then it's going back up, but the average rate of change from the beginning to the end of this function is zero. Let's look at another example. Another function here, and we're looking at the average rate of change from negative two to four. So once again, we see the beginning at negative two right here. We see the end, the end, the end of the interval is four. The first thing we ought to do is find the output values at negative two. Well, look at the graph. The output for negative two is negative four, nice and simple. What is the output for four? Once again, look at the graph, nice and simple. We get eight. So now to find the average rate of change, we're going to subtract the outputs on top, eight minus negative four. Subtract the inputs or the x values in the denominator, four minus negative two. Uh, we get a plus on top, so that turns into a 12. We get a plus on the bottom, that turns into a six. So the average rate of change is a beautiful, wonderful two, or you could say two over one if you want to keep it as a fraction. But again, if we connect these lines, 
I'm going to do uh, my best job to make a straight line here. It's not perfect, but there we go. Okay, so even though in between negative 2 and 4, this function is changing, man. This function is going up really, really, really fast, and then it drops really, really, really fast, and it goes back up really, really, really fast. Okay, so it's changing a lot from the beginning to the end of the interval, but the average rate of change from negative 2 to 4, the average rate of change is 2, and that is the slope of the line that connects them. Now, what if you don't have a graph? How would you do this if you did not have a graph? You were just given the function. No graph, function. Well, it's actually not that whole lot different. So once again, we want to find the average rate of change from the closed interval 2 to 5. So the first thing we got to do is find the output for 2. Well, when you have a graph, you could just look. But when you have a function, you got to plug it in. So I have 6 minus 2, then a square root of that, then multiply that by 2, and then I'm going to add 4. Could probably do that in your head, but feel free to grab a calculator if you need to. 6 minus 2 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8. And what about the output at 5? Once again, I'm going to plug in 5. 5 minus 2. Or not 5. Oh, my gosh. 6 minus 5. What the heck? I can't, can't write right now. I can't talk right now. I'm plugging 5 into the function. So I have 6 minus 5. Square root of that times it by 2, add 4, 6 minus 5 is 1, square root of 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 plus 4 is 6. All right, so now to find the average rate of change from on the closed interval 2 to 5, I'm going to subtract my outputs on top, 6 minus 8, subtract the inputs in the denominator, 5 minus 2, 6 minus 8 is negative 2, 5 minus 3 is 3, so the average rate of change is negative two-thirds. So from two to five, the average rate of change of this function is two-fifths. Okay, a couple of comments here on the rate of change, right? So a rate of change could be positive or negative. So if we notice we looked at the last two examples. We got a negative, and we also got a positive. So a positive rate of change just indicates that as one quantity increases, the other quantity does the same. So we notice that you know, if we go back to this problem where we had an average rate of change of 2, um, when we made that line connecting the beginning to the end, we saw that we had a positive rate of change. So from beginning to end was a, a total change of a positive value. In this answer here, we got a negative 2 thirds. So this just means from 2 to 5, if I were to actually graph this function, if I look at 2 and I look at 5, there would be a negative rate of change between them. So just pointing out that rates of change can be positive or negative. All right, so what about finding the average rate of change between two points? Well, what essentially what I want to tell you is that this is actually the same thing as that we just did. The average rate of change between two points on a function is the slope of the line that connects the two points. Hey, I kind of already showed you that in those graphs, right? The average rate of change from the point A comma F of A, how do you get F of A? Plug A into the function. To B comma F of B, how do you get F of B? You take B, plug it into the function is the slope of the secant line, which is the line connecting the two points. A new vocabulary word here. So when we have two points on a function, we connect them with a line. The slope of that line is our average rate of change, but that line is called a secant line. Now, I know you might remember a secant line maybe from geometry class. A secant line is a line that crosses a circle twice. And that's kind of where it gets the name secant line here as well, because if we have two points on a function and we need to cross both points, well, we're crossing the function at those two points. So that's kind of where it fits in with the definition of a secant line. Now, how do you find the slope of a line? Well, listen, this is no different than what we just did. F of B minus F of A, outputs on top, B minus A on the bottom, inputs on the bottom. Pretty simple. So here's another example where we say find the average rate of change between negative 1, 8 and 3, comma, negative 4. So again, instead of me just saying, hey, 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 where this is a closed interval, we're only going from negative 1 to 3, well, I'm just saying, okay, we have a function, but you know, ignore everything. We're only looking from negative 1, to, comma, 8 to 3, comma, negative 4. So it's, again, it's no different than what we just did. Now, the beauty here is I already gave you the inputs and the outputs, so to find the average rate of change, which is the secant line, this would be that actual secant line. Oh, boy, that is... It, it, rotten. I, I'm just embarrassed by that straight line. Okay, just pretend I can't. Just makes it so hard. But pretend there's a straight line there. Uh, could this make it any better? No, it's still terrible. But okay, I got a straight line to connect the two points. That's my secant line. To find the average rate of change, all I got to do is find the slope between them. Negative 4 minus 8. Outputs on top. 
Inputs on the bottom, 3 minus negative 1. On top, I get negative 12. In the bottom, I get a positive 4. Overall, that is an average rate of change of negative 3. And you can actually see that the fact that it's negative makes complete sense. The rate of change, the slope of that ugly green secant line is definitely negative. The average rate of change from beginning to, pause, beginning to end is negative 3. All right, here's another one, but this time, again, no, no graph, right? What do you do when you have no graph? Oh, come on, it's not that hard. So all we got to do is get the beginning point and the ending point. So we're looking for the average rate of change from negative 3 to 0. So the first thing I got to do is figure out what is the y value for negative 3. I'm basically figuring out what is f of negative 3. To do that, all I got to do is plug negative 3 into this function. Not too bad there. On top, I get negative 9 plus 2 is negative 7. On the bottom, I get a negative 8. Altogether, that makes positive 7 eighths. So the output when x is negative 3 is 7 eighths. You could write that as a function notation, or you could write that as a point, negative 3 comma 7 eighths. But, um, you know, pretty simple there. Plugged in negative 3. Hopefully that was not too hard. Now i got to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to plug in 0. So i got to figure out what happens at 0. This is f of 0, getting my output value. Plugging in 0, I get 3 times 0 plus 2 all divided by 0 minus 5. Let's see here on top I get 2 and the bottom I get negative 5. So we get negative 2 fifths. All right, so now i got to find the slope in between these points. So again, how do you find the average rate of change, which is the slope of the secant line connecting these two points? Subtract the outputs on top. So we get negative 2 fifths minus 7 eighths. All divided by subtracting the inputs in the bottom, 0 minus negative 3. All right, the bottom's pretty easy to do. Don't need a calculator for that. That's going to be a positive 3. Now, I love working with fractions. So let's see if I can do this in my head. So let's see if I can make the common denominator 40. 5 and 8 both go into 40. So let's see here. That's going to be multiplying by 8. That's going to be negative 16 fortieths minus multiplying by 5, 35 fortieths. So negative 16 fortieths minus 35 fortieths is negative 51 fortieths. That's not too bad. Now that looks ugly. We hate these double fractions, a fraction inside of a fraction. So we're going to take the numerator, negative 51 over 40. Instead of dividing by 3, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal of 3, which is 1 third. And then we're going to try to reduce this, and this is awesome because 51, or 3 does go into 51. 17 times 3 is 51, so the 3 reduces with the 51, turning it into a 17. So we get negative 17 over 40 as our final average rate of change between these two points. Pretty ugly answer, but it's, it's, it's still a number. Don't, don't, don't let fractions be um, non-numbers. They're still numbers. So again, the average rate of change of negative 17 fourths. So again, in this video, we're talking about finding the rate of change between uh, in an interval or between two points, but essentially it's the same thing. All you got to do is find your points and find the slope of the secant line, the line that connects those two points, and that is how you find the average rate of change between two points. All right, hopefully you learned a lot in this video, but stay tuned for another video over how to find the rate of change at a given point. All right, talk to you later.